This lecture focuses on comparing proportions from case control studies, in which the two groups of interest are cases, people who have the disease of interest, and controls, people who do not have the disease. Recall that case control studies are carried out after the fact, or retrospectively. The researchers purposefully select cases who have already experienced the outcome of interest, and then purposefully select controls who have not experienced the outcome. The number of controls is chosen in advance to be an integer multiplier of the number of cases, and controls are typically chosen to be similar to the cases in age, gender, and other relevant characteristics. The researchers then look retrospectively back in time to see how many of the cases and how many of the controls were exposed to the risk factor in the past. In contrast, Prospective studies select participants who do not have the disease and follow them forward in time to see if the risk of experiencing the outcome depends on group or exposure status. However, prospective studies can be time-consuming and expensive to do, especially if it takes years for the outcome or event of interest to occur, or if the outcome is very rare. Case control studies are useful for exploring possible risk factors for a disease or condition and are often the preferred design for studying rare diseases or outcomes. Ideally, we want to compare two proportions using the risk difference or relative risk, as we can in prospective studies. But when we have a case control study, these measures are meaningless due to the case control sampling strategy. That is, due to the fact that the number of controls is chosen in advance to be an integer multiple of the number of cases. Instead, we use another measure of comparison called the odds ratio. The material for this lecture was developed by Ian Brearley and Laura Lay at the University of Minnesota's Department of Biostatistics. I am presenting this lecture with their permission. Let's explore an example. A case control study was carried out to investigate the relationship between antidepressant use during pregnancy and autism spectrum disorder in the children. 298 case children with ASD and their mothers and 1,507 randomly selected controlled children who don't have ASD and their mothers were drawn from a large healthcare organization in Northern California. The researchers chose to have a ratio of about five controlled children per one case child. The controlled children were matched to case children by sex, birth year, and hospital of birth. The researchers retrospectively collected information about maternal use of antidepressants during the year prior to delivery, our exposure of interest. Of the 20 with ASD, I mean, excuse me, of the children with ASD, 20 of the mothers had used antidepressant drugs during the year prior to delivery, which is 20 out of 298, or 6.7% of the cases. Of the controlled children, 50 of the mothers had used the drugs, which is 50 out of the 1,507, or 3.3% of the controls. Based on this, we can see that the proportion of maternal antidepressant use during pregnancy is higher in the cases than in the controls. How might we obtain a single quantity to compare these two groups? And could this large of a difference be the result of sampling variability? Or is this evidence of a difference? Let's use statistical methods to answer these questions. Before we move on, let's discuss the arrangement of the table for case control studies. This table looks similar to what you've seen in a previous lecture. But notice that this time, this table does not have a fourth column with totals, as the table for a prospective study would. This is done intentionally to emphasize the fact that case control studies must be analyzed differently than prospective studies. It is not appropriate to say that of the 70, in other words, 20 plus 50 children whose mothers used antidepressants during pregnancy, 20 of them 2.8% developed ASD for two reasons. First, the study did not begin with people who did not have the outcome, ASD, and then follow them over time to see if they experienced the outcome. It started with children who already had ASD. The risk of a healthy child developing ASD, therefore, cannot be determined from this study. Second, the number of ASD cases relative to the number of children in the study is fixed in advance by the chosen ratio of controls to cases. Risks, risk differences, and relative risks should never be calculated from a case control study. So how do we compare two categorical variables when we have a case control study? Answer, the odds ratio. 
But first, what are odds? In general term, our odds are the probability of having the event or exposure divided by the probability of not having the event or exposure. Probabilities always range between 0 and 1, so odds range between 0 and infinity. For example, if a horse race runs, if a horse runs 100 races and wins 10 times and loses the other 90 times, the probability of winning is 10 over 100, which equals 0 0.10 or 10%. But the odds of winning are 10 divided by 100 divided by 90 divided by 100, which equals 10 divided by 90, which equals 0 0.111 or 11%, or one win to nine losses. Notice that the total number of races canceled out between the two probabilities, and we were left with count for event divided by the count for non-event. Or, as another example, if a horse runs 100 races and wins 60 of them, the probability of winning is 60 divided by 100, which equals 60%, but the odds of winning are 60 over 40, which equals 1.5. Notice that when the probability is low, the odds and the probability are more similar. Recall that the recommended way to display the 2x2 two two table is to have the two groups that are being compared in the rows and the outcome of interest in the columns, with the event of interest in the first column. This is mentioned again because it is very important to have rows and columns in the order presented on this slide. If you mix up the rows and columns, then you are mixing up A, B, C, and D, and the formulas as presented in this lecture won't be correct. To calculate odds, we find the odds of being exposed in group 1, our cases, and the odds of being exposed in group 2, the controls. If the proportion who were exposed in group 1 is A divided by A plus C, which is the total number of cases, then the odds of being exposed in group 1 is A divided by A plus C, all divided by C divided by A plus C, which turns out to be A divided by C because the denominator of A plus C cancels out. Similarly, the odds of being exposed in group 2 is B divided by D. To compare odds between two different groups using division, we use the odds ratio, which we abbreviate as OR. The odds ratio is defined as the odds of being exposed in group 1 divided by the odds of being exposed in group 2. As previously stated, group 1 is the cases and group 2 is the reference or control group. If the group of interest has higher odds than the reference group, then the odds ratio will have a value greater than 1. Whereas, if the group of interest has lower odds, then the odds ratio will have a value less than 1. An alternative way of translating this ratio of interpreting this ratio is to translate this value into a percent. If the odds ratio is less than 1, we translate this into a percent decrease, since the odds is less in the group of interest than in the reference group. We do this by taking 1 minus the odds ratio times 100. If the odds ratio is greater than 1, we translate this into a percent increase since the odds is more in the group of interest than in the reference group. We do this by taking the odds ratio, subtracting 1, and then multiplying that by 100. Note that the odds ratio may be used in perspective in cross-sectional studies, but it must be used in case control studies. The data from the autism and maternal antidepressant use study is shown here again. Of the children with ASD, the odds of the mother having used antidepressant drugs during the year prior to delivery is 20 divided by 278, which equals 0 0.072. Of the control children, the odds of the mothers having used the drugs is 50 divided by 1,457, which equals 0 0.034. The odds ratio then is 0 0.072 divided by 0 0.034 which is 2.096. This means that children with ASD had roughly two times higher odds of the mothers having used antidepressant drugs during the year prior to delivery compared to, to control children. Alternatively, since the odds ratio was greater than one, we could calculate the percent increase as, in odds as 2.096 minus one, take that value, multiply it by 100, and get 109.6%.
the odds of the mothers having used antidepressant drugs are increased by 110% in children with ASD compared to controls. Thus far in the lecture, we've been talking about the exposure odds ratio, which is the odds of being exposed comparing cases to controls. Does this feel odd to anyone? The exposure happened first, and then the outcome, diseases in general terms, or ASD in our example. It would be great if we could have a summary measure that we interpret as we intuitively want to. That is, the odds of having the outcome, the disease, comparing the exposed to the unexposed. This is called the disease odds ratio. Well, we're in luck. Odds ratios have several useful properties that are almost magical. Recall that the exposure odds ratio is A over C all divided by B over D. Doing a little rearranging gets us to A times D all divided by B times C. Let's see how to calculate the disease odds ratio. If we calculate the odds of having the disease for the exposed, we would focus only on the exposed row in the table, those that have the disease, A, divided by those that don't have the disease, B. Similarly, if we calculate the odds of having a disease for the unexposed, we would take those that have the disease, C, divided by those that don't have the disease, D. Putting these two ratios together to get the disease odds ratio results in A over B, all divided by C divided by D. Doing a little rearranging, we get A times D, all divided by B times C. This is exactly the same number as the exposure odds ratio. Magic. As previously noted, it isn't appropriate to calculate the probability of disease in the exposed in a case control study. The same logic would apply to calculating the odds of disease as we just did for the disease odds ratio. However, since the disease odds ratio is always exactly the same number as the exposure odds ratio, either of them can be used as measures of the strength of association between exposure and disease. You are likely to encounter both. Now, let's use statistical inference, specifically confidence intervals and interval estimation, to understand if what we observed is due to sampling variability or if there is evidence of a real difference. The calculation of a confidence interval for an odds ratio is similar to the calculation of a confidence interval for a relative risk in that it's a two-step procedure. We see that the first step looks very similar to the general formula for a confidence interval. We have our point estimate plus or minus the margin of error. But it is for the natural log of the odds ratio. This is because the sampling distribution for odds ratio does not follow a normal distribution, no matter what the sample size is. But if we take the natural log of the sample odds ratio, then the sampling distribution for the transformed measure is approximately normal. Applying this transformation allows us to use normal-based methods for calculating the confidence interval. So step one is to calculate the confidence interval for the natural log of odds ratio, where the point estimate is the natural log of the sample odds ratio, the degree of confidence is the appropriate z value, and the estimated standard error of the natural log's odds ratio is as shown on this slide. Then step two is to back transform the confidence interval values found for the natural log of odds ratio by taking the anti-log, the exponential function. This will produce the lower and upper limits of the confidence interval for odds ratio on the original slide. The confidence interval formula presented on the slide only applies when all of the assumptions are met comparing two odds. These assumptions will pre be presented in a couple slides. Remember to check the assumptions first before carrying out any inferential method. Now, let's figure out how we can make conclusions about statistical significance using odds ratios. Let's ask the same question again that we saw in a previous le lecture. If the, odds in the two, if the odds in the two groups were equal, the null hypothesis, what value would result using this comparison measure? In other words, what is our null value? Because the odds ratio is a ratio measure of comparability, similar to the relative risk, if the odds in the two groups were equal, we would take the ratio between them, then the null value would be one. So if the null value does not fall within the confidence interval limits, 
then this value is not plausible, and therefore we would have evidence that the true population value is different than the null value. This situation is shown in the first plot above. The confidence interval does not include the null value of, in this case, 1. And I don't mean the first plot, I mean the first line above. Conversely, if the null value falls within the confidence interval limits, then it is a plausible value, one of many different plausible values. And we would not have enough evidence to say the true population value is different than the null value. This situation is shown in the second line above, which is in red. This confidence interval does include the null value of 1, but you'll note that the one above in blue does not overlap with that value of 1. Now, let's calculate the confidence interval for the odds ratio for the autism and maternal antidepressant use example. The sample odds ratio of having ASD between maternal antidepressant use during pregnancy and no use is 2.096. Taking the natural log of this value gives us 0.740 and the estimated standard error for the natural log of OR is 0.273. The Z value for a 95% confidence interval is the value in the standard normal distribution with 0.975 of the area lying below that value. So the Z value is 1.96, as it always is. Putting all these values together, the point estimate, the Z value, and the standard error, a 95% confidence interval for the natural logs of the odds ratio is between 0.206 and 1.274. Now we need to exponentiate those limits to get the 95% confidence interval for the odds ratio. Exponentiating 0.206 equals 1.229 and exponentiating 1.274 equals 3.577. We are 95% confident that the odds ratio of having ASD between maternal anti antidepressant use during pregnancy and no use is between 1.229 and 3.577. Another way of stating this is that the odds of having ASD for children whose mothers used antidepressants during pregnancy is between 1.229 and 3.577 times higher than for children whose mothers did not. Or we could say a range of plausible values for the true odds ratio for ASD between maternal antidepressant use and no use is from 1.229 to 3.577. Because the confidence interval does not include one, it is not a plausible value and we can conclude that the odds ratio comparing the two groups is statistically significant. There is evidence of a difference in odds of ASD between the two groups, with those who were exposed to antidepressants in utero having between 1.229 to 3.577 times the odds of those who were not exposed in utero, or 22.9% to 257.7% increase in odds ratio. I mean, increase in odds. Statistical inference, specifically in this case interval estimation or cal calculating confidence intervals, for comparing odds relies on several assumptions. First, the samples should be random or representative samples from the respective populations to allow us to generalize the results to these populations. The observations within each group should be independent of one another, and the observations in one group should be independent of the observations in the other group. Third, we assume that the sample is large enough for the sampling distribution for the natural log of the odds ratio to be approximately normal. For this statistic, in a prospective cohort or cross-sectional study, large enough requires that n sub 1 times p hat sub 1 times 1 minus p hat sub 1, and n sub 2 times p minus p hat sub 2 times 1 minus p hat sub 2 be at least 5 where n sub 1 is the number of exposed individuals, p hat sub 1 is the sample proportion with the outcome among the exposed individuals, n sub 2 is the number of unexposed individuals, and p hat sub 2 is the sample proportion with the outcome among the unexposed individuals. In a case control study, large enough requires the both m sub 1 times p hat sub 1 times 1 minus p hat sub 1 and and m sub 2 times p hat sub 2 times 1 minus p hat sub 2 to be at least 5, where m sub, one, m sub 1 is the number of cases, p hat sub 1 is the sample proportion of cases that are exposed, 
m sub 2 is the number of controls, and p hat sub 2 is the sample proportion of controls that are exposed. If the sample size is too small, other methods such as bootstrapping should be used to compute confidence intervals. If these assumptions are violated, the confidence intervals we calculate may give us faulty information about the true population odds ratio. While the odds ratio is distinct from the relative risk, there are times when it is a reasonable estimate of the relative risk. This is another magical property of the odds ratio. If the disease being studied is relatively rare, then the sum of A and B, the total exposed, would be approximately equal to B because cell A would be a very small number. And a similar argument for the not exposed row, the sum of C plus D would be approximately equal to D. Using these approximations in the relative risk calculations results in the odds ratio formula. So if the disease is relatively rare, the odds ratio from a case control study is a good approximation of the relative risk that would have been obtained from a prospective study. What would we consider relatively rare? Answer, a disease with a prevalence below 10%, but the lower the prevalence, the closer the odds ratio will be to the relative risk. When the prevalence is not low, however, the odds ratios always overestimates the strength of the association between exposure and disease. The fact that you can get a good approximation to the relative risk from the odds ratio is a reason that odds ratios, rather than some other me measure, are used to analyze case control studies. Relative risks are easier to interpret and easier to explain to non-statisticians, except for maybe gamblers. And they directly express what is usually of interest to us, which is how the risk of getting the disease is affected by the treatment or exposure.